If you are an advocate of fitness and healthcare joining forces, then today's episode presented by the Fitness Business Podcast and industry expert Michael Stack is the episode you have been waiting for. Stay tuned for another amazing educational episode from the Fitness Business Podcast. Have a favorite episode guest? Maybe it was Kia Williams, Shay Wheeler. What about Adam Sedlak? Hey, these are just to name a few. Whichever guest it was that is just your favorite, we'd love to have you shout out on your social media outlet along with a tag. We love to hear from you. It really helps us tailor our guest list to your liking. Share it, tag us. It is that easy. Hello, FBP family. I am your host, Dory Nugent, and today our industry expert is just that, an expert in his field. Michael Stack is a clinical professor for the University of Michigan School of Kinesiology, and he is the creator and the host of the Wellness Paradox podcast. Michael joins us today to discuss the topic, making fitness a part of healthcare. We will hear from Michael in less than two minutes, First, a huge shout out to MyZone for supporting our show. MyZone has pioneered unique wearables with talking point technology that makes the difference. Reach more members of your community and keep them engaged for longer through motivation and gamification wherever they choose to work out. In the gym, at home, or outdoors, we're stronger together. Get in the zone at myzone.org. Have you checked out MyZone lately? Hint, hint, maybe you should. www.myzone.org. Check them out. Get your pen ready now for Keep Me's Fit Bizpiration. What are your top three pieces of advice for local businesses to evolve into healthcare for their communities? The first step is to hire qualified professionals. We must hire degreed and certified professionals, preferably through the American College of Sport Medicine. Step one, without a doubt. Step two then is actualize those professionals to make a difference in the communities. Get them out there having conversations with stakeholders in the allied health space. That's not just doctors, but that's also physical therapists and nurse practitioners and PAs and anyone in allied health that they can have a conversation with. And then step three, when they're having those conversations, provide value, provide resources, provide tools, give those people in the healthcare system tools and resources that make their jobs easier and make caring for patients better And if they do that, those three steps, hire good people, get them out in the community and have them giving resources, that will move us more towards getting on the healthcare continuum. After this week's full interview, I'll introduce you to next week's industry expert, Brittany Lynn. Brittany is the founder and the CEO of the Human Connection Agency, which is a PR agency that serves purpose-driven entrepreneurs worldwide. At Discover Strength Franchising, we know you want to own a thriving fitness business. We believe you should be able to do work that you are passionate about while also making a great living. Imagine owning a distinguished fitness business backed by a market-tested business model where efficient 30-minute strength workouts are provided to your clients by expert, educated personal trainers. Here's how to get started. Head to discoverstrengthfranchise.com and fill out the contact form. Set up a pre-qualification call with our franchise team. Join us for a mutual discovery day. So head to discoverstrengthfranchise.com so you can start falling in love with your work again. Without further ado, let's transition into this week's interview. Welcome back for another episode of the Fitness Business Podcast. My industry expert today is Michael Stack. Michael, welcome to the Fitness Business Podcast. Thanks, Dory. Happy to be here. 
We are really excited to have you here. Your background is phenomenal. You are a clinical professor for the University of Michigan School of Kinesiology. You are the creator of the Wellness Paradox podcast, which we're going to talk about uh, in just a short second. And you're also the founder and CEO of Applied Fitness Solutions, which I believe you have a couple locations. Yep, four locations in southeastern lower Michigan. I want to just kind of talk to you right off the bat about your podcast. It's called The Wellness Paradox. Now, I find that that's such a very unique name. So I'd love for you to tell all of our listeners out there exactly what does the name mean and what exactly do you cover on your podcast? Yeah, I appreciate that as a starting point. And I'm glad you find some uniqueness in the name. For me, the the wellness paradox has always been this notion that there's a, a massive disconnect between our healthcare community and our fitness and wellness professionals. And the disconnect in my mind exists in three areas. The first area is trust. There's not trust between the medical community and the fitness and the wellness community. Uh, There's not interaction between those two communities. And there's not a collaborative effort to improve population health. And that's incredibly paradoxical to me because now with the, the chronic disease epidemic that we have as a country, it is fitness and wellness professionals and intensive lifestyle interventions that can mitigate some of the most pressing chronic disease issues that we have as a healthcare system. And the fact that we're not talking to one another at the very least, but interacting with each other for the betterment of population health, uh, that is an untenable paradox to me. And the goal of the podcast is is to put this out there and say, you know, not only do I think this, but there are other people that think this, and not just a few other people, there are a lot of other people that think this. And on the podcast, we try to talk about different ways to view the entry into the healthcare system for fitness and wellness professionals. I've been uh, very, very blessed to have a lot of amazing guests that have been able to talk about this from multiple different perspectives. And I don't imagine that any one episode or even all of my episodes will solve the paradox, but at least if it moves the conversation in the right direction and creates a greater level of conscious awareness around it, then I think we're doing something positive, not just for our industry, but for the health of our country. One of the reasons why we brought you on to the Fitness Business Podcast is because there is definitely a disconnect. I get a lot of people asking me for more episodes like this, which is why we're today's topic is called Making Fitness Part of Healthcare. So I'd like to just ask you your opinion on this, and that is, are our systems across the globe set up for healthcare or sick care? Yeah, without a doubt, it's set up for sick care. And I would even maybe amend the second part of that term to say we're set up for sick management. We do a very, very good job of managing illness in our, in air quotes, healthcare system. And there's many reasons for that, far more than what we can get into on a short podcast. But we're not set up like that now. But we're moving in that direction. I I truly believe that there is momentum behind moving to more of a of a health care type of model. What we're sitting here as we record this, these two days are the future of fitness summit that's being put on by club industry. And it's to talk about the healthcare fitness integration. And these conversations are happening, but as we know, medicine is very institutionalized. I don't want to use the word archaic, but it's definitely slow to adapt. There's a lot of inertia in the current quote unquote healthcare system. And we need to start being very forward thinking about how we modify our systems if we are truly going to be healthcare rather than sick management. Now, if you had a crystal ball and you could look into it, you looked at five years, 10 years, 20 years, tell everybody listening about your vision for healthcare and the integration. Well, my ideal vision, and I don't even know if it becomes a reality in 20 years, is that you would have exercise and fitness and wellness professionals who would have access to EMR systems, they would uh, electronic medical records, they'd be getting direct referrals from physicians, they'd be able to provide feedback to physicians. I think a good 
proxy model for this is physical therapy for orthopedic issues. Uh, that, in, in that entire ecosystem is exactly what can exist for chronic lifestyle diseases such as diabetes and other cardiometabolic disorders. And we can have the same infrastructure, but we haven't started to develop it yet. But if we patterned it after physical therapy, I think that's the ultimate way to effectuate this vision. And that's a case where physical therapists are working hand in hand with orthopedic doctors to improve overall health of the patient on an individual level and then overall population health on a broader level. I don't know how you feel about this. I definitely feel like the fitness industry is really trying their best to make a push to integrate this. It's just the question of, is the medical side trying to do the same, make the same exact effort as the fitness industry is? Well, I think a progressive cohort of the medical field is because I think they realize what's happening from a reimbursement perspective, not to get too much in the weeds on this, but we are definitely going to a value-based care model for reimbursement. We're going to a model that is capitated where basically they're going to say, Hey, you're going to get X amount of money for this patient when they come in. And it doesn't matter how long they stay there for, or what drugs you administer or what treatments you do, you're only getting X. And we know, COVID is a great example, that somebody who is not as fit, is not as healthy, is going to be a greater economic drain on the system. So I think that healthcare is moving in that direction because reimbursement is going to move them there, follow the money in any business. But I also will say that I think our industry is pushing this initiative, but I don't know, and I can expand on this if you'd like, I don't know if we're using the right language and the right imaging, and then the right overarching narrative to actually make this a reality. So how would you make it a reality? I think our messaging as an industry has not changed in 35 to 40 years. Our messaging largely makes the fit fitter, essentially. Like we are talking to the same 15 to 20% of the population. If we are going to truly become part of healthcare and work with the other 80 to 85% of the population, we need to start using more approachable and inclusive language and imagery. I think we need to move away from words like fitness and exercise. It doesn't mean we discard them, but we start to also use words like physical activity and movement. I think our imagery And the the people that you see in our ads and our commercials and our print ads and our social media ads, they need to look like the people that we want to help. They need to be diverse in terms of body shape, body size, gender, ethnicity. There's such a broad spectrum of people out there for us to help. But if you look at our messaging, our imagery and our narratives, it's still all centered around the 15 to 20% of the population that we've been working with for the past four decades. And until we're willing to start to change those things, even just by a little bit, I don't think we're set up to really effectuate this transition the way we want to. What I see that's very unique about yourself is that you're coming from a club owner and you're also coming from a professor at, you know, obviously at the University of Michigan. So putting those two hats together, what are the necessary steps that the fitness industry needs to make to help continue to push this in the right direction? I think in a word, trust. We need to cultivate trust. And we do that many ways. I think the first way we do that is by becoming more educated as an industry and speaking the same language that the medical community speaks. And I think this is where my two worlds do coalesce because I'm teaching in this academic setting with the lens of the fitness industry, but I'm trying to get these young fitness professionals to understand the language that they need to talk with in order to be able to communicate effectively with medical professionals. But the the trust extends even beyond just the, the requisite knowledge and, and using the proper language. It's also about taking the time to build relationships And I think that that's a big thing that we tend to not spend a lot of time doing in our industry is getting out of the four walls of our facility and having 
coffee with a physical therapist, buying a primary care physician lunch, and not necessarily doing it because you're trying to get something from them, but maybe you're trying to just add value to what they're doing. I can't tell you how many primary care physicians would love to have a trusted fitness professional they could refer to because that guy or gal has 10 minutes to do everything they need with that person that walks in their office. And if he could offload or delegate some of the lifestyle change tasks to someone they trusted, it would be a game changer. So we have to build trust. We definitely have to get out of our four walls. And I think more broadly speaking as an industry, and I realize this word scares people, we need to move towards licensure for a certain segment of our fitness professionals. Not everyone, there can be a spectrum. Again, I'll I'll use my proxy of physical therapy. There's a licensed physical therapist that exists who is kind of the trusted orthopedic professional. And then there's a physical therapy assistant, a PTA, that's not a licensed professional. And I think we can exist on that continuum in our industry. And I, I think licensure is a big key. And I don't necessarily see us getting this across the finish line until we're willing to move towards unification in licensure. You mentioned the word physical therapy. I'm starting to see physical therapy offices start to make residency in health clubs. How do you feel about that? I think it's a great gateway. If we're able to use that gateway properly, because somebody who comes to physical therapy can easily be handed off to a exercise specialist after they've completed their physical therapy. And for anyone that knows anything about physical therapy reimbursements, most patients are getting six, 12 visits that are approved by their insurance company, and they still need a lot more work. I think this is, it's just another conduit through which we can engage with the healthcare community. And I think it's a very obvious relationship because they're doing exercise in a rehabilitative context. We do exercise from a fitness and a health context. And it just seems like there is a lot of seamless integration that could exist there if we're willing to think creatively about how we can develop those relationships. Overall, I think it's a very, very good thing because I think it can act as a gateway to help get fitness and wellness professionals on the health care continuum. What I find interesting, and I'd like to hear your take on it is, you know, these drug reps come into the doctor's offices all the time and they gain such a trust with the drug reps. Wouldn't it be nice to see personal trainers come in and have the same appointment time with a physician to gain the same exact trust? You're preaching to the choir. And here's the great thing. There are significant restrictions on what drug reps can do, what they can say, what they can provide. There are no restrictions for fitness professionals. Now, I'm not necessarily saying you should go and buy the doctor a trip to the Caribbean or something like that, but we have so much more latitude there. And I also think we have the opportunity to really add value to that physician's practice. I don't think the the approach of a drug rep going in there to push a drug on a physician is the approach that we can take. I think we can go into a physician's office and say, hey, I would like to be able to provide this resource for you and your patients to where you're actually adding value before you ask for anything. And in all honesty, I guarantee every fitness professional that's out there that works in a health club or maybe has their own private business, you have not just one client, but multiple clients who either are a physician or have strong relationships with their physician where they could be your warm connection. They could be your foot in the door. And all it takes is one conversation with one primary care physician for you to have more clients than what you could ever want because most PCPs see 500 on the low end to upwards of 1,500 on the high end patients. And if even a small percentage of those end up coming to you, uh, you have more business than you know what to do with. Wouldn't you just love to see instead of the doctor writing a script for a blood pressure medication, the doctor to write a script to go for a gym membership and to exercise to help maybe either lose weight or, you know, to help with the blood pressure? It's happening and it's happening in places. The, The medical fitness centers are also a great example of this. And kudos to the MFA for everything that they've done. But I want to say there are maybe 40 certified medical fitness centers around the country. And if we're really going to make a difference on population health, we have to proliferate that model beyond just those 40 or so medical fitness centers. 
I had a guest on a couple months ago and she has all these amazing certifications for personal trainers to take on such great niches, such as like, you know, working with clients with osteoporosis, working with clients uh, that maybe have scoliosis, you know, arthritis, elders. And, and she just says they don't get taken advantage of as much as you would think they would. Yeah. And I think it's it's incumbent on our industry and leaders in our industry to take a more proactive approach with educating their professionals. From my perspective, and this is how I've always ran my business, we have an education stipend for all of our fitness staff. And in all honesty, if they use their entire education stipend in a year and they came to me and they said, hey, I'd like to take this other course or buy this other book, I would gladly do it for them. We absolutely have to invest in the continuing education of our professionals if we are going to effectuate this vision of being part of the healthcare continuum. Doctors have to do CMEs. We know as trainers, we need to do CECs, but they actually have to be meaningful and impactful to this larger mission. It just can't be simply reading an article and answering some questions and then being done with it. We need to do things that are going to move us in the direction of being educated to work with special populations. How great would it be that you could advertise that you specialize in, you know, post rehabilitation or, you know, again, working with somebody with osteoporosis or maybe like postmenopausal for women, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, specialization is something that is very resonant with medical professionals. They understand the concept of specialization. And I think our industry, we need generalists in our industry, make no mistake about that. But we also need specialists, just as the medical field has generalists and they have specialists. Absolutely agree with you. So, hey, one last question here. And Again, I'm going to ask you to be a visualist, and that is, where do you see fitness professionals and health clubs fit in this new healthcare solution? I see fitness and wellness professionals as, as frontline providers. I see what you said earlier is that you have a physician that recognizes that a patient has some type of chronic lifestyle disease, and they write a script for that patient to go see a fitness and a wellness professional. And it's probably a multidisciplinary team. We have to understand that we have a scope of practice and we have to stay in our lane. The exercise professionals prescribe exercise. The dietetics professionals prescribe things that are nutrition related. But I see them as a frontline therapy, just like metformin now is the frontline therapy for someone who is pre-diabetic or diabetic. I would love to see, instead of that prescription being metformin, that a lifestyle intervention is prescribed. We see how that goes. And then maybe we consider metformin down the line. But I'd venture to say, if we do the lifestyle intervention well, we're never getting to the metformin. Well, Mike, I really appreciate your time today on the Fitness Business Podcast. I feel like we really just scratched the surface with this. You know, we'd love to maybe have you back again and kind of dive into this even deeper, maybe even just next year, see where we're at if we're getting a little bit further. But really appreciate your expertise in this topic. I think it's uh, much needed. Thank you so much, Dory. I love being here. And I quote, we need to cultivate trust through education and speaking the same language. If you have taken anything away from this episode, let it be that. Well said, Michael Stack. Thank you, Michael, from everyone here at the Fitness Business Podcast and from all of our FBP listeners. They will benefit immensely from today's show. Looking to contact Michael? www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com is where you can find our show notes that contain Michael's contact information. Another great option is to subscribe to the show notes and they're emailed directly to you. Subscribe to the show notes also at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. In 30 seconds, I will introduce you to Brittany Lind, who is next week's industry expert. 
Did you know that the active ingredient in most disinfecting wipes has well-documented lung, skin, and reproductive health concerns? That active ingredient is called a quaternary ammonium compound, or a quat, not necessarily something you'd want in a health and wellness facility. VaporFresh disinfecting gym wipes avoid all quats and instead use an innovative citric acid chemistry to disinfect. Even with this greener chemistry, VaporFresh is still EPA-registered to disinfect 99.9% of surfaces. VaporFresh is trusted by some of the most premier gyms and college recs centers nationwide. With 1,200 wipes per roll and four rolls per case, they offer an unbeatable value per wipe. Order today at VaporFresh.com or Amazon. Quickfire 5. The Quickfire 5 questions are always fun because I never know what our guests are going to say. Let's hear what fun surprises Brittany has in store for all of us, not only with her answers, but what you can expect from her upcoming episode. It is time for Quick Fire Five with next week's guest, Brittany Lynn. Brittany is the founder and CEO of The Human Connection. The Human Connection is a PR agency that serves entrepreneurs worldwide. Brittany, it's Quick Fire Five time. I am so excited. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Great to have you here. Looking forward to your answers for the next four questions. Let's get started. The first question is, what is a life lesson that you learned during the pandemic? So the life lesson that I picked, which is hard to pick, right? Because I think we've all learned plenty of life lessons during the pandemic. But I think the one that sticks out to me the most is... I can truly do anything. So when the pandemic started, I lost half of my clients all in one week because we work with a lot of small business owners. And so they had to cut their budgets. And if they couldn't have people coming into their shops, you know, kind of what we help people do is like get their, you know, businesses out there. What was the point of having a PR agency? So I feel like if I, as a business owner have can weather through that, I can figure out and do anything. So that's the the main life lesson I've learned. Great life lesson. I like that. Very powerful. All right, here we go. If you could play a character in any movie, what character would it be? Who I decided was Sandra Bullock in Ocean's 8. And I'll say that Ocean's 8 was not the best Ocean's movie, but I love I love that whole series of movie. And the reason why is because the whole movie is just like a a puzzle, right? Like you're putting together the pieces of like what happened and who's connected with who in those like heist type movies. And I just think that that would just be so fun to play that type of character. All right, Sandra Bullock, it is. (laughs) All right, please complete this statement. Sunday morning, you can find me. This is an easy question to answer. Sunday morning, you can find me snuggled up with my two pups, drinking a latte that my husband made and reading a book. You said you like to read. So why don't you give us a book recommendation? Yes. One of my favorite books is called Super Normal by Meg Jay. And it's a nonfiction book. And it really explained a lot about my personality to me. Like there was just a lot that I learned that I didn't I couldn't place as to like why I was the way I was. And that book just like really explained it to me. So if you are a person who you've been through adversity or you've had to have like resilience in your life, maybe you went through something traumatic as a child or growing up or even more recently, it's a book that kind of explains the phenomenon of like, you know, two brothers can have like the same you know, they grow up in the same household and one of them is super successful and, you know, has a great life. And then the other one, you know, isn't as successful, just has kind of just more trouble, like just kind of getting on his feet, that type of thing. And that book explains like the differences as to why. And I just think it's so fascinating. And she's been interviewed on a lot of podcasts. So if you look up Meg J podcast interviews, she's just incredible. So I, I love that book. All right. I think that's a great recommendation. We have not had that one yet, but I think a great. Lot of, yeah. Yes. I, I think a lot of our listeners could relate. So great recommendation. Thank you. All right. Drum roll, please. Here is your 22nd elevator pitch on why our FBP family should come back next week to listen to your episode. 
So guys, during this episode, I'm going to teach you anything and everything of how to pitch yourself to be a podcast guest. Like I am here right now on this podcast. Um, we're going to be talking about the evolution of how, how I got onto this podcast. I'll be talking about why podcasts are one of the best ways to grow your audience, to grow your influence, to increase your brand authority, your brand trust, which is going to in turn send more clients your way. Um, so we're just going to be covering all things podcasting. And maybe you haven't thought of being a guest on a podcast before. I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know. Uh, next week episode, I get to have a little fun with Brittany Lynn as we talk about how to pitch yourself as a podcast guest. Mark your calendar. I'll see you next week. Thank you to our founding partner, Active Management. Our partners, Keep Me, My Zone, Discover Strength, Tribe Team Training, One Fit Stop, and ISSA. Also, thank you to our advertisers, Rex Roundtables, MX Metrics, and VaporFresh. We believe what you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but woven into the lives of others. Mm -hmm.